three o'clock, so time for sober cocktail hour. Um, uh, I'm Virginia Heffernan, um, and um, and uh, I wrote a, the re reason I came here is that I wrote a piece for Wired recently about new approaches to sobriety. Um, I took an old approach to sobriety 12 years ago um, and joined a 12-step group and um, a very satisfied customer, but I was really interested in um, ways that possibly seemed easier um, or, or more scientific or like a lot of people are put off by AA and other programs because of the quote, God stuff. So you know, maybe these things looked easier. And I, I looked into them and honestly, for me, they just did not seem easier. <laughs> like one of them is like to take a drug that makes you, uh, uh, makes alcohol taste bad and terrible, which seems bad. And, um, and then it can get you down to 10 drinks a week, which to me sounds terrible also. Because for me, the choices are zero or you know, 250 drinks a week. So, um, so 10 just seems terrible. But I know some of those processes work for people and there are a lot of, um, a lot of ones that don't use traditional religion or more, more spiritual, more meditative. Um, but along the way, I got interested in non-alcoholic drinks because, um, you know, anyone who's sober here knows that there you know, are at least two parts, but putting down the drink is only the first part. So, um, you know, the second part is this kind of getting yourself spiritually fit so you don't reach for a drink or you don't need a drink. Um, and, um, and, but that first part, putting down the drink, you then find yourself, though, you still have the need to actually just swallow hydrating beverages. And when wine or beer has been the thing in your hand all that time, uh, whiskey, tequila shots, um, you need to have something else. And my first sponsor told me, fall in love with your non-alcoholic drink. So it's not a source of embarrassment. You're not just like, um, uh, I, get, I have to order off the kid's menu, we were saying. Um, so, um, so I've gotten interested in some of these drinks and mocktails too. And, and, um, and they do a lot and they do a lot for people who are not like me, who don't, aren't, seeking 250 drinks a day, but are just like, I just got through a run and I don't want to feel heavy or, um, or alcohol has been associated with some like bad nights in my life. So I want to like, you know, kind of keep it, keep it down or stick to let toast at a wedding, but I still just like want something to put in my hands. Um, and, um, and so when Bill and I started talking, our first conversation was, I thought our first conversation would be about marketing, would be about whatever, but it was about addiction and drinking. And so I thought we might start out um, before we kind of get into the investor deck stuff, <laughs> um, which is relevant. I thought like Bill might, you just might start to tell us your sort of story with alcohol. Um, and, uh, you know, and then I'll share a little of mine and then, and then we'll go on and talk about NA drinks. For sure, yeah. Um, well, I'm so excited to be here with Virginia and at this amazing conference. Uh, thank you so much for having us and uh, just all the activities around it. We actually do unexpectedly have cold beer with us too. So I might <laughs> put it here if anyone wants to jump up and grab one. Oh, yeah. I know there are a lot more out there for after as well, if anyone wants to try. But don't, don't worry about interrupting if anyone wants a cold beer. <laughs> um, but in that, I'll My talk while people are grabbing sorry. that. Um, yeah, from the out from the outside looking in, I don't think you would have known I had an issue with alcohol. Um, I think uh, you know it. Uh, the word for it is very much functioning, I guess, but not really functioning under the surface. Uh, I was not living up to nearly my potential. I started drinking at some point in high school and just liked it way too much. Every time I drank, like I was just a very social person with a huge appetite, love being out around people. But at the end of the day, the world is so stressful and I was so busy. I think there was something about alcohol as a de-stressing thing that I really liked too much also, kind of turning off the stress. And over, call it a 12 year period, it became a regular thing that like crutch that I turned to way more frequently, more alone, more after every stressful day. Um, you know, there's a phrase referred to as lower companions, where like all of a sudden a lot of the productive, healthy people in your life drop out of your social events. And there's like the people you can convince to stay out till midnight or 2 a.m. on a weeknight all of a sudden. And, 
you know, I was, I was very much functioning. I was still waking up at 6 a.m. and like getting, my, I worked at one of the world's top hedge funds before I started athletic and thought I'd do that the rest of my life. But under the surface, my productivity and performance and ceiling were just way lower than they should have been. And alcohol was affecting my performance at work, my health, my diet, my relationships. I was about to get married. Who knows if that was actually going to happen when I stopped drinking. Um, you know, my wife, a few stories leading up to this, like there's so many mile markers along the way that I should have seen were you really need to stop drinking moments that I kind of blew through. Um, like one of the most notable was my sister had her first child and we're very close as a family. She called me, told me, I didn't remember it. A few hours later, I was driving home in the morning from New York City to Connecticut and called and like just checked in. And I was like, oh, when's the baby coming? And that was like such a sad personal moment. Um, another one not that far after that was my wife had organized this amazing 30th birthday party in the Caribbean. And I got home very late from a work event and forgot my passport in New York. And we were just too far gone to catch the flight at that point. And like, there were a lot of things like that where I was like, wow, that should have been the moment. There was never like a, like a legal moment that like actually did it. And all of a sudden I was just sick of it. Everyone finds their moment at one point. And, you know, I, I think if I had known that it, I wasn't such an isolated case, it might have come earlier, but like the outside world has done such an effective job. You know, for so long, we got all our health information related to alcohol from like alcohol advertising mm -hmm. or like the FDA food pyramid. And obviously, we all have phones in our pockets, and information is getting more and more accessible. And like it is easier to share messages like this now, but there was no real forum except for very private conversations 10 years ago about things like this. And um, so at my point, I realized just that, you know, I felt like I was hitting a wall at full speed and very luckily I randomly in this occasion made the decision to stop drinking and asked for accountability from my wife, my colleagues who were senior to me at work. Mm -hmm. I was unexpectedly open with them and other people in my life. And I was just open with the decision I was stopping drinking and I was shocked that like nobody cared really in yeah. some ways. And uh, I think they're all excited for me also, but then out of the woodwork, they're like, Oh, you should talk to this guy. Like, Oh, the number three guy in the firm sober. And like, he turned out to be an incredible mentor for me. And like all these people I respected. And I, I think it, maybe it also is helpful if like zooming out, like as I realized I wasn't the only one who I kind of realized the <laughs> enormity of alcohol in society. Um, you know, I realized I wasn't like in the 0.1%. I was in the like probably 10% of adults who really suffer with alcohol. 14.8 uh, million Americans are documented alcoholics. 40% uh, of incarcerated adults, the incident happened while under the influence of alcohol. Um, there's 1.4 million violent crimes a year against strangers under the influence of alcohol. Um, and then so many more stats, like 232 million missed days of work due to alcohol per year. The impact, economic impact of hangovers is like $250 billion. And you know, 200,000 people a year die from alcohol directly. One in every five deaths under 50 are alcohol related. And like the stats, as I uncovered this, were like, whoa. Like, yeah. And uh, yeah, so that was like, I kind of like walked into this and started research. I was like, wow, this is a enormous societal thing. Yeah. And so I feel like I've been talking a lot. So. No, 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 yeah. not at all. Um, yeah. Uh, well, you said people couldn't tell from the outside, right? People could tell from the outside in my case. I like to think that I was high functioning and I definitely had a job. But there were moments along the way where I thought everyone was still drinking like I was. Um, and um, I would just be surprised that the bottle of wine was gone and that no one was like rushing to order the next bottle, you know? Um, but I was. And I just assumed like, oh, maybe there was just an oversight with them or they must be on their seventh drink also. Um, and later when I got sober, they were like, no, no we were only, tr I, I said, I'm sorry, I'm going to let you guys down. I'm not going to be able to drink with you. And they were like, we only drank like that because you did like that. Or we only kind of pretended to drink like that because you did. Um, 
so 2011, I, well, going back a little bit, I was a, a, just an early, early adopter of all drugs. Like if I heard about, so, you know, I started like putting whiskey in milk, you know, when I was like 11 or 12 um, with my friends. And then if I heard about a drug, so, and it was around, so, uh, it's the 80s, so it was cocaine. It was like, it, you just could sniff them out. You know, like if I heard like some cough syrup has codeine in it and I knew codeine was an opiate, I would like try to figure out how to have a cough that would get me that kind of thing. And it was like almost like a kind of sixth sense that I was proud of. And then hearing about benzo, so like Xanax or clonopin, um, and um, they would just like, like one of my sort of drug buddies would be like, these drugs find you, you know, and I would be like, that is a magical power of mine. It's just like somehow those substances come into my life. And um, I had I had acquired so many drugs so illegally and so many pills that I got a boot box like big enough, you know, for a pair of boots. And it was just stuffed with loose pills. And I could just like look up RX Finder and find out what they were and, you know, take a few before a meeting or take, or, you know, and wash it down always with the screw top, white wine, just goes down fast, easy to get, you know, cold, nothing like difficult or interesting tasting, you know, just sweet, cold, whatever. And um, I came to a point where my marriage was in trouble, my work life was in trouble, and there were other spiritual problems, and I had two young children. Um, and uh, I, it was like they sometimes say in AA, like I was licked. I, I was licked in my actual life. Like it wasn't, there wasn't, I didn't associate any of, any of my problems with alcohol and drinking. Sort of like these things like, what is 40% of people in prison their crimes are done under the influence of alcohol, but like you don't think alcohol is the problem, right? And so I used to do this thing where I would be like, maybe I am an insomniac, maybe I am depressed. And every time the checklist would be like, maybe quit drinking. And you know, and then the next one would be like, how about electroshock therapy? And I'd be like, well, I'm not quitting drinking, so I'll do the second one. And like, no matter how hard the second one was, I definitely was not doing the first one. Um, and um and so, you know, I was talking to another friend. Oh, I think I maybe maybe mentioned to you, I was like covered with bruises and I didn't know where I got them. So of course I was like, well, I'm definitely not an alcoholic, so I must be like a hemophiliac. Like just invent syndromes to explain why all these things were going wrong in my life. And um, yeah, I thought I had Lyme disease. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes, actually, I, it, my friend Ian, um, who I got sober with, said that um, he was addicted to heroin and that he was living in a squat and um, using toilet water to clean his needles. But he was a vegan. <laughs> he was just like, I think meat's the problem here, um, and totally like demon. And of course, you think everybody else is the problem. Like, forget about other people. Forget about your children, your husband, your whatever. Anyway, it seemed like I was like really going to have logistical and emotional problems ahead. I was about to be divorced. I was about to lose this job and a few other things were going to happen. And I realized that my coping mechanism was just drugs. Like I just had not created a lot of, um, you know, healthy meditation practices or whatever. Um, and, um, and so I had this like leaving Las Vegas kind of plan that I would just take that boot box and, um, you know, go to a hotel and just kind of drink myself to death. And that seemed like a pretty good idea. Then my other idea in my decision tree was to try this thing called getting sober. And they both seemed equally kind of terrible, like really comparable, like, drink self to death or do some stupid thing like give up alcohol. And I called a friend who like, I am just infinitely grateful, but he was like, why don't I try the second one? Just today, try the second one. And I was like, mm, I don't know, I'm sort of, you know, this is, I think you've made a, the bad choice in the Coke Pepsi thing, you know, getting sober, that seems awful. My cool leaving Las Vegas plan has a lot to recommend it. Anyway, fortunately I opted for the second and have been sober since then. Um, there were like some hairy moments when I couldn't figure out how to get to sleep without Ambien. Um, I called someone in the program and um, she said, you have to say this to yourself tonight, which was, uh, 
God loves me. I'm God's child. And I was like, that's terrible. I'm definitely not saying that. But I didn't have anything else, right? I just didn't have, I didn't know how to fall asleep. And um, so I said those lines, like, God loves me. I'm God's child. And I probably said it like, you know, 1,500 times. And at some point I fell asleep. Um, so, you know, for the first 90 days, you try to avoid people, places, and things. So, like, you know, your low companions or your, like, dive bars or just all the things that, like, kind of, you know, excite you and put you back in that state. But at least the program I'm in is very into, it's a bridge back to life. You're not meant to, like, lock yourself away in some kind of temperance, abstemious. You're not supposed to take on a lot of other, like, now's my time to run a marathon and I'm going to give up dairy. And, like, you only have to give up one thing, you know, for us. And um, so I, those 90 days, you know, I was just, like, in a convent. I was, like, you know, other friends of mine in other programs, like, they can't go places where there's strip clubs or whatever. There were bars I couldn't go, go anywhere near, you know, like, long trips to get away from them. But that's only the first 90 days. The great thing is, after 90 days, those things, it turned out, were no longer triggers for me. I could see all my old friends. I could, they say, go anywhere, do anything. And then I wanted to just be at conferences. You know, I, I wanted to, um, I remember like I was going to do something in um, Telluride and one of my sober friends said, what if Angelina Jolie offers you a drink? <laughs> and I was like, why would that make it different? I'd be like, it's Angelina Jolie, I better get drunk. You know, like just that wasn't gonna be the temptation, but everyone has their temptations. But you also want to live a life. And so I had to find a drink to order, and I just didn't want a Sprite. I didn't want a sweet drink. I just, a lot of alcoholics really like stinging bitter drinks. Like, I just, I way prefer the flavor of, like, Campari or bitters or something to, like, just Coca-Cola. And, um, and the idea that there was some like dignity preserving non-alcoholic option that you could feel like an adult and that you didn't have to drink something sweet. That was sort of my nightmare. It was like soft drinks are always just so sugary and caffeine-y and those are not my drugs, right? So, um, so I've just been so grateful that there's this option to still stay in your life with, you know, with this drink. And then I got really interested in people who don't need or want like the giant spiritual program that's associated with, you know, sobriety and AA and who have just found ways that like their performance and relationships are suffering. You know, I should say, I thought I had every problem in the book. And for me, when I quit drinking, I was like, get any bruises anymore. I guess my hemophilia cleared up and, <laughs> and my brain cancer and my all other things and my relationship issues. Um, it's been pretty smooth sailing. Of course, like I've had every, you know, every normal life problem, but um, it's just like, man, the sober life, it's great. And I know there are a lot of people with, with sober Janu dry Januaries and with uh, the decline of binge drinking on campus and the rise of like cannabis being more available, who just kind of want to like take the ethyl alcohol out of the equation, um, and I think that yeah. that's who you're really addressing. Yeah, it's yeah, def life definitely got easier in so many ways. It still has all the challenges and is like hard work for sure. But like, there were just so many things that like washed away that were unnecessarily difficult to yeah. um, health, sleep, everything, and. I had this like intellectual curiosity turned back on yes. and um, as I kind of self-diagnosed my situation, I, I realized it was escaping the stress of the world. I was ultimately very unfulfilled in my career also. Yeah. And I think I honestly would have hit fast forward on a number of years to get through a few more years of my career at any point, which is a sad thing in life. And like, I think there was that lack of fulfillment and I just never had that purpose really. And that, purpose kind of did emerge with this also because yeah. like you said I was I was very committed to my sobriety I went to meetings at least once a week for 90 days and beyond and helped a number of friends get sober too in a lead by example fashion and sorry this isn't all about sobriety also but it's I think starting with where our stories are is somewhat helpful um 
but I was immediately back in bars and restaurants. I loved food. I loved beer. I liked work dinners. I liked social dinners. I liked weddings, bachelor parties. And I was in all these places. And I just wanted a beer and a drink or anything that I was excited to hold. And it was a great compliment to, to my food. And yeah, the situation of ordering drinks when you're out in especially work drinks, but social also, like ordering non-alcoholic drinks used to be so hard. And like the music would stop at restaurants when you tried yes. to order it. And, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Or like if you had a group of like 12 people at a table, like everyone would zoom in on you as they like fumbled your order and they're like, put ordering on hold for the whole table while they go look in the back for like one non-alcoholic beer. And right. Like, I was just like so frustrated that and it blew my mind. And I know 50% of people in the restaurant aren't really drinking at all. I was like, there's this big economic opportunity, right. but then, um, you know, this fulfillment opportunity emerged also in my life that, um, you know, I, as I stopped drinking, I realized, wow, a lot of people aren't drinking, but the, the web of alcohol does affect a ton of people too. And, uh, yeah. so it, all of a sudden there was this chance to positively affect a lot of people. And um, for the first time in my life with that idea, like there was fulfillment and excitement and I was just so energized by that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's, yeah, amazing. When you said about also affecting other people, um, I told you this on the phone. Uh, one of the guys that a sober buddy of mine was telling me that he was at Carnegie Hall about six months ago and in New York and he was there for a show and he's been sober a long time. And at the intermission, a woman um, was really drunk and she vomited all over the lobby. And then some people helped her into a cab to go home. So she missed the second part of the show. And I was thinking, you know, if that were me or like one of the women I sponsor, you might have thought, oh, another embarrassing night, right? But he was saying, and he was saying, that's what he would have thought. Oh, another embarrassing night when I was drinking and whatever. But the thing that you just didn't know is it was an actually horrible night for the people that cleaned up your vomit. And it was a terrible night for the person that like suddenly was paying a cab driver for a stranger that they were carrying into a cab. And then the cabbie that has to deal with getting you into your house when you get home. And all this collateral damage that comes because you just were treating your own problems and you just couldn't like if you're just like feeding this constant hole in yourself, you're not thinking for a second about like the possible positive good you could be in other people's lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, that sort of childish feeling in early sobriety where you're like, help people, sorry, what's that about? Yeah. Um, you know? And I, like literally I wasn't a fully formed adult. I was yeah. 30 years old and I was really in the body of like a 15 year old. And right. you know, you just don't necessarily have that full development. Yeah. yeah. There, I know there are a lot of athletes here, and you are an athlete, and thus athletic. Um, but sometimes I think, like, because uh, if you were seeking stress relief, I was definitely seeking peak experiences. I sort of that like was like, this will be exciting, this will be fun. Later, I was kind of treating dysphoria and whatever when it was sort of in mother's little helper mode. But early. I wanted these peak experiences, and when I keep hearing about surfers here and if people who do more thrilling sports, like. Sometimes I think like if I just been more coordinated or athletic, I would have found it, you know, like skydiving or whatever you guys do, <laughs> sporty things. Um, but, um, you know, it just seemed like a hack. Like I was like, oh, this, you know, cocaine, like I'll get myself to that place that you guys are too. And in the last, whatever it is, 12 years, like to my surprise, it turns out some of the things that I thought were just kind of excuses to drink, like dancing or sunset or whatever like yeah you know, like early in sobriety there was like you're gonna really enjoy a sunset and I was like well that's fucked up there is no way like I was like when the sun is going down that's something you're supposed to enjoy you know so like some of this conversations about nature therapy um is like none of this would be possible if I weren't sober mm -hmm. you know I'd be like rushing to get back to my room making sure that there was like um uh, room service, you know, and just that I could just, just get back to my happy place, which is like sitting in bed with a drug or a drink, you know, and like, yeah. And just the corniness of like, wow, this movie is just good. Like you don't need any, you know, or whatever, or like, oh, falling asleep is not like 
an Olympian act that takes like a lot of drugs and whatever, you yeah. know. I had no idea that sleeping through the night peacefully as an adult was a thing. Oh, I yeah. was just like, right. every day I'd wake up at 4 a.m. with like, just like unnerving work stress. And yeah. Um, yeah, like I fell in love with mindfulness, with meditation. Yes. Really regrettably fell in love with athletics and endurance and working out like six years after my athletic career ended. Oh, that's <laughs> right. Like, you said yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, and it's like I just became <laughs> obsessed with like trying to help people get paths out of there. Like before, so like kind of the situations we're describing are endpoints, which unfortunately like so many people get to like tens of millions of people in society and like it like the idea so I had worked on athletic brewing as this business plan and had the economic opportunity for two years but it took like really realizing the impact it could have as being something that wow I can't like turn this idea off and I quit my job like five days after I had that realization okay. but yeah, it was the potential path to like give people like tens of millions of people a better path in a way um, it's help introduce moderate like off ramps way before people get to points we're talking about where, you know, if it was totally normal as you're coming of legal drinking age, turning 21, if there is a non-alcoholic and an alcoholic menu that's equally as exciting, five years ago there weren't any name brands on the non-alcoholic side, and now it's been socially permission enough that, like yes, athletics on that page, but you can get a Guinness, a Corona, a Bud, a Heineken, like. All the name brands have a non-alcoholic version now. Right. And so this is the first generation of 21-year-olds who are coming of adult. And you can get all the cool brands in non-alcoholic fashion. Yes. Right. And so separating like what your, co what your cocktail is from your coping mechanisms yep. is probably a great idea. And you know? like, Who knew? Like you could actually do something healthy to deal with your problems. And you could order a drink that tastes good that is not that doesn't double as your only way of surviving in the world, you know? Yeah, and it doesn't come with career risk, family risk, right. car risk, everything. Um, can be healthy. Um, and so it was like, and these are big, unstoppable forces. Like, every day I feel like we read about disruption and like, yeah. it's like, there's like such, these buzzwords like disruption and pivots and everything that are thrown around, but like, Drinking is a 5,000-year habit in society. It yeah. is a freight train and really tough to change stigmas around. And it is just moving. And still, like, it seems like this category and movement has made so much progress. And it is still at, like, the beginning of awareness. Yeah. Um, and I think that will come with time and with options and with social acceptability. But um, that just got me so excited that there is potentially – yeah, so I, I said really lightly that I helped a couple friends get sober. And, mm -hmm. like, so after I'd gotten sober, they, like, asked me about it. They are like, what was that like? Oh, like, how did people react? I'm like, people did not care. Oh, yeah. I'm, I was like, let me help you. Ask me a million questions and, like, read this book. Come with me to a meeting and I'll make it really easy to get your foot in the door and then it's all you. Um, but, uh, like, when those first, like, two out of three people I tried to get sober, like yeah. got sober. And it was like the most meaningful thing to then see yeah. them like interacting with their families and like yeah. be on their journey. And like when my, it was really my wife who like connected the dots for me. She was like that, but I'm like this idea you've been working on and that are like kind of the same thing. Yes. Like it's, you could do that. And so that was like where yeah, the like light bulb really went on for me. So who do you see, um, I mean, you don't market to sober mm -hmm. alcoholics or recovering alcoholics. Um, you're not like around the rooms being like, come on to our thing. Um, but who do you see like picking up athletic? Like who's, who are some of yeah, and our, some of your profiles of clients? Yeah, our goal isn't, to, I do worry about like marketing directly to recovering alcoholics because it might tempt them to bars. And if, um, yeah. But at the same time, like I, from the moment I got sober, was going to bars and restaurants and liked being with friends. And mm -hmm. um, so I wish there were options there. And so we want to be a high quality option that's there for people who are looking for it anywhere. Right. And um, we hear a lot of those stories um, and like literally thousands a year of like super nice emails or as in stores around the area today and like heard some really nice stories. And 
Um, so it is an option for recovering alcoholics, but also it's just an option in the cooler that, you know, if there's yeah. five brands of beer and athletic is one of them or any non-alcoholic options, whether it's a non-alcoholic spirit at a bar you're at, a non-alcoholic mixed drink or something, um, like a lot of people just choose the moderate option yeah. and are like, you know, actually I have some emails I have to send later, or I'm going to pick up my kids. Like there's kind of that line in the sand moment in a day when you have a non, when you have an alcoholic drink, there's like a very large subset of activities that mm -hmm. are off your plate for the rest of the day, or at least a few hours. But you can like, you can just have a non-alcoholic drink, enjoy your company, enjoy your meal, and go on with your life also. And a lot of people choose that. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, it is something like 80% of our customers do drink alcohol at other times. Right. And But otherwise are just choosing a more moderate option at different occasions. Yeah. Or, or enjoying nice drinks at more occasions, too. And so I think our goal is hopefully those lines blur a lot over time in society. Makes um, sense. Do you, um, we talked a little bit about Cigarettes Are Sublime, which is this 20 year old book, I think, by Richard Klein. Did anyone read it? Um, it was, he was on the occasion of him quitting smoking. This academic wrote a book about what he'd gotten out of smoking. And it was just sort of a love letter to, like, a goodbye love letter to cigarette smoking. And he, it got deep because, like, you don't just pick up you know, like, why not just wear the nicotine patch if you're just in it for the drugs? So he was, like, really into, and I think anyone who has ever smoked knows, like, just the camaraderie, the romance of lighting someone else's cigarette, the, like, the movies, and then the smokers. Like, even when I went to college in 1987, everyone said, even if you don't smoke, put that you're, you're looking for a smoker roommate because smokers are just cool, so you'll end up with someone cool. It's so crazy to think that that really was a thing. And then just, like, ashtrays and whatever. And there's so many rituals around drinking that are just as interesting and romantic and like thinking that you would like never, you know, pour a glass of wine, you know, with a loved one or share beer or whatever is seems seems like just so potentially heartbreaking, like just because like one tiny component of it is like a neurotoxin to you. Mm -hmm and an addictive one and ruining your life, then suddenly like you never get to sit at a bar again. You never get to do all this stuff. And you know, his Richard Klein's point ultimately was like, once we were done with cigarette packs, suddenly we were like, oh, look at this thing. It's got a cool shape to it. I like holding this. I can't shake a cigarette out of it, but I think I'll spend a lot of time looking at it. Um, so, um, you know, having something in that cold, like when you just said, there's cold beer here, there's ice. You know, there's just like all things that we have these like pleasing associations with. We don't need to hate ourselves because we like hanging out with friends having beer, mm -hmm. right? And so I sort of, yeah, I didn't like having to turn on myself, sorry, for all these things just because I was giving up mm -hmm. drinking alcohol. You know, I wanted to appreciate the good of that. And so like having it at the center of the ritual and also someone who really understands all the things that beer drinkers love about beer. For sure. Yeah, they're like deeply ingrained multi multi generational habits for sure. And yeah. Yeah, some of my favorite rituals were like a glass of red wine with pasta on Friday nights and to like take away the wine is like taking away like half of my favorite part of the week. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Or, um so it is like the meal pairing and the occasions and like meeting up with someone you haven't seen in a while and having ordering that drink like yes. trying to make that really special and elevated um and there is a lot to it like just sitting on the couch and like cracking a beer and smelling the malt and the hops like i think that is like deeply ingrained and triggers a lot more evolutionary that relaxes people than the alcohol that hits you like two or three hours later like that first moment in the ritual is awesome and, yeah um, so, yeah, we're definitely trying to recreate that and, like, just yeah, give people back those moments or just make it totally seamless also. Yeah. And I think that will change in society over time. But then there, I think there's just all these positive ripples that could be so big also. That yeah. as, you know, as people start to make those choices, like, yeah. with slightly greater frequency. Like, previously we were talking about people making those choices with, like, 0.3% of the time. So like a rounding error to zero. Um, now people are making those choices like two to 5% of the time, mm -hmm. but like 
logically it might make sense over like 10 years that people make these choices like 50% of the time or like 20% 20 of the time would be enormous but 50% would actually like make sense right but if you start thinking about those numbers I said in the beginning like how many people are incarcerated because of alcohol how much lost productivity how many people just like turn their mind off every single night like what does that unlock mm -hmm. in society mm -hmm. And like, what could that wave of productivity and like mindfulness and just normal behavior yeah. look like over time? And it, it just gets me so excited to think of what that future yeah. in the 15 to 20 years could look like. Um, super exciting. There was some time, um, just so the numbers come to life a little more, of like how at least my life was impaired. So, you know, I quit drinking when I was uh, pregnant when I was trying to conceive and when I was breastfeeding. So a lot of the kids childhood, I was physically sober. Um, but I had started to drink again when my younger kid was two and I was giving her a bath one night and, you know, I had already been drinking and I was already thinking toward like, I just need to get alone and asleep and for whatever, get through this, this bath. And like some little, little bit of it came into my head that I was like, I'm bathing a human being, you know? That's like a huge privilege and a huge, like, this won't happen forever. I may never do this again, and I won't, she'll be a different size tomorrow, the next time I dry, right? And I was like, I was just like, why is this the thing that I've chosen not to be present for and to rush through, you know? Mm. Like, it's one thing to think like I'm waiting at the airport and I, I wish this were went faster. But the second you think like, I, I, this is annoying, this is a chore, I don't wanna do it. And you're looking at like a naked baby in the tub. I just, uh, there were moments like that that I was like, this is wrong. Like this is what you're supposed to be living for, mm -hmm. not trying to rush through. Um, and those are small levels. Now we're talking about with some of the numbers you gave us, you know, not just drunk driving, but, you know, I have so many, you know, there's so many sober horror stories, but, you know, a friend of mine is waiting for a liver. Um, and, you know, the last 20 years of his life have been really challenging and it gets down to the liver transplant and just wait. I mean, you know, that could, ha that could happen to any of us. Like he just like was a college kid and just kept drinking, you know? Um, and domestic abuse, child abuse, you know, goes from the neglectful bad bath, you know, where you're like, could this kid drown? Like, just the responsibilities seem overwhelming, you know, all the way to like really, really dangerous um, kind of behavior. And I think it's like really worth considering in the specifics mm -hmm. um, how, um, what risk we're inviting into our lives with, with that much drinking. So tell me about some of the um, ways that trends in sobriety have dovetailed with NA um, and athletic in particular. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we got whether it was I don't know if athletic would have worked five years earlier. I don't know if like the world was ready for it. I think information being at people's fingertips and the proliferation of more available health stats and uh, mindfulness and open dialogue and transparency and things um, like this great conference. It, the forum for exchanging ideas in society and getting better information to everyone is opening up at an unprecedented pace. And I think the timing of athletic trying to introduce this movement um, was probably a very good time. But it is uh, like it has started a not only athletic, there are a number of brands. There's something like 150 non-alcoholic beer brands and 50 non-alcoholic spirit brands. and um, But just the overall societal movement, too. Um, I think for the first time, those choices are more destigmatized, permission, mm -hmm. availability of alternatives um, are starting to get out there. It's still very early in availability and like awareness and those mm -hmm. things. But... Um, it is exciting when, you know, so I, for the first, I, I left one of the world's biggest hedge funds where I had like 300 salespeople and like they would, anytime I called any one of them would pick up on the first ring and be like, so excited the phone rang and 
when I quit my job to work on that alcoholic beer, I did not have a phone call or email answered for like six months. Yes. And um, <laughs> it was like a really dark period. But then we started to sell our beer and like all these signs started to happen. And like randomly all these elite athletes started to reach out. Like, you know, like champion Ironmen were like, hey, I've been drinking your beer. Like, I love it. It's my training beer. Like, would you like to talk about a sponsorship deal? And you know, we had like NFL players reach out and like, you know, like JJ Watt was like, hey, drink your beer on Saturday. I'm not ready to be like the face of your company, but like, he was like, could I invest? And like, there were all these like green shoots where I was like, whoa, like these are like a lot of high performing people like recognized it so early. And I was like, that is a very cool sign for society. Yeah. And, um, I know you wrote so thoughtfully about like influencers and celebrities and we in no way want to make it seem like easy, like sobriety is an easy thing or have any disrespect for the challenges people are going through at all. But I love the fact that people like JJ Watts, a perfect example. Um, Carly Kloss also reached out and invested in our company mm -hmm. and like these like really high profile people, mm -hmm. um, some celebrity chefs have started to lend their name to the category mm -hmm. saying like, this is a good option, or I drink this, mm -hmm. like gives it somewhat social proof yeah. that makes it an easier and easier to choose those moderation off ramps too. Right. Um, and then really thoughtful writing about the category and coverage of it, like prominent displays and retailers, and it all builds on itself mm -hmm. and makes those choices easier and easier for people. And, you know, once that social proof shows up, then people can talk about it at a barbecue with their friends and actually like, turn the label around and like, like make sure people see it and like yeah. want people to like talk about it. And <laughs> like, so, but it, it is like really cool to see that momentum happening because there was no momentum in the beginning and it was super dark and like no one wanted to talk about it. And you like see these green shoots and it, that's when, and like, then you start to hear stories from customers too, like getting those moments back you reference. Like mm -hmm. we get emails all the time where, they're like so heartfelt, but it's like, haven't been able to have a beer with my dad watching a baseball game in like 25 years. And we had a beer last Saturday and like have never emailed a company before. Or, um, you know, we got, uh, so uh, just last week we got an email from a woman who'd been trying to stop drinking for some really long period of time. I want to say it was like 38 years. Okay. And not your prototypical like haze bro like hazy ipa drinker yeah at all but she was like i tried your we were just talking about bitter drinks mm. and she was like i tried your ipa and she was like i just thought it was the coolest thing ever and had the best flavor she was like after 38 years i randomly was successfully able to stop drinking and she's like i tell all my friends about it i think oh. it's the coolest thing but it's like emails like that yeah, where yeah, it's yeah. like all these little moments in society are like I'm like, boom, that's why I quit my job. I'm like, it's right. it's happening on a big scale. And it's like, it's just happening. And like the tide is just starting to turn, but it feels like, you know, that 5,000 year habit is like starting to like go past high tide and maybe start going out. Right. Which, yeah. So there are all those like little proof points, which are really exciting. That's and, amazing. Um, And it, the, I was looking into the, perpetual mental health crisis on college campuses and it basically called recalled a crisis every year since 2000 but they're blame on blame it on different things and binge drinking was the culprit for a really long time and binge drinking is way down and I was telling you I told my my daughter that um people are drinking less now and she was like oh you mean that bro 80s drink where everyone just like got got really drunk from kegs like it was like from ancient times and no one had ever thought of it you know she was like she's just in the world of like cannabis and psychedelics basically I mean she's 14 so it's not that yet but do you know what I mean like so the cultural associations like change so much over time right mm -hmm. and um and but I think demonizing the part of yourself that wants to connect that wants to do all the things that alcohol did for me. I remember some, you know, a fr sober friend of mine was like, I just wanted a higher power to do for me what Crown Royal did for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just like you've got some drink that you're obsessed with and it does all these things for you. And you like have, it's just, it's like, 
that starts the night after you're, you know, after like you've done all this work and you finally like do something for yourself, right? But when you get sober, you sometimes start to think like, I was just selfish and terrible and all the things I did, including wanting to bond with people in dive bars or whatever, all of them were terrible, which is like a certain enormous unkindness to show yourself. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of, this is why I brought up the cigarettes are sublime, where he ultimately was like, smoking was like praying. It was like making my breath visible and it was this, it, like beautiful experience. Okay, nicotine, okay, cigarettes are gross, whatever. And ultimately he found other solutions, but it was really nice uh, to not beat myself up and be like, some of that was just me needing, wanting to relax with friends. Yeah, there's you often know? like so much behind the drink, you know, it's yes. like, like, what are you really trying to solve with the drink? And, right. Um, yeah, and like it, helping people get to those answers and like give them solutions and whether they're like totally non-functional drinks, whether they're alternatives, whether it's just the community and conversation. And yeah, yeah, I think it's all things that we could all be a lot more cognizant of. Um, I'll say one more thing, which is that the Wired piece started because I was in Williamsburg in New York and um, there were just like some super groovy, like, you know, kids in their twenties or whatever, like, you know, the woman was in like a romper that was like the tiniest, thing, whatever. Anyway, and um, and they were just having some like cool hipster conversation, and they were like, "Everyone's getting sober now." And one of them was like, the the guy was like, um, "Yeah, babies." <laughs> and I was like, "That is interesting. It's like we can't drink till, legally till we're twenty one, so you associate not being able to drink with like being a child. And then there's this moment where you can drink, and as awkward as it is and I have a friend who said that like at his bottom he woke up with a drag queen who looked who bore a resemblance to the Reverend Al Sharpton that was his bottom um, it's my favorite line I actually made it Ted Cruz in the piece because complicated reasons um I wanted to bash Ted Cruz and I love Al Sharpton um but anyway he um he said um so you know is that adult thing Right? Like, is that really what, like, we sure know where you're mature when you're, like, you know, waking up on mattresses in weird places or you need a liver. Nothing's more mature. Um, and, um, and so, like, somehow flipping it a little bit, not in a moralistic way, but just, like, you know, it's kind of a sign of being an adult, like, not falling down the stairs, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, um, and just even thinking, like, tonight's not the, a night I'm going to, I'm going to, um, you know, wake up with someone I don't know or whatever um, is kind of like just a nice step in maturity, right? Yeah. It doesn't mean you have to have a milkshake and a juice box. Um, For sure. Yeah. It's uh, definitely had a lot of miles in my drinking career and was definitely really happy as an adult to put it back on the pile and <laughs> like retire it. For sure. I thought yeah. that was a, definitely a nice adult moment. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm going to switch uh, open to questions. I guess we have like 10 minutes left. I, we didn't talk about the brewing process or about the sort of financials of the company. So obviously that's up for grabs or you can just talk about good drinking, bad drinking. <laughs> yeah, really total open book. I mean, it's Good. Okay. Um, Ronald. The question was about the brewing process. Um, oh yeah. When we want to get mics to people. Yeah. Oh, did you have, could you want to bring one to him really quick? Can you tell me about the brewing process? <laughs> <laughs> Thank that, you. <laughs> so it kind of is our top secret thing. However, uh, like kind of my first principles moment with starting Athletic was the product has to totally change and the marketing has to totally change for any of this to have any traction mm. at all because both were really disappointing and underinvested for decades. Like non-alcoholic beer in 2015 looked very much like non-alcoholic beer of of uh what century it would be like 1925 like essentially in the middle of prohibition um and so we really wanted to strip it down and totally revisit it scientifically and i read every brewing textbook i could get my hands on and we wanted to not use any of these big industrial machines and like totally decompose the process of fermentation and just do a like really truly nuanced fermentation with natural variables without the alcohol, which was a huge challenge. And um, 
my co-founder, who I found after hundreds of rejection interactions, <laughs> uh, he moved him, him and his family across the country from Santa Fe, New Mexico to Connecticut, where we homebrewed in an empty warehouse. On There were like three Gatorade jugs in a row. Uh -huh. And like he taught me so much about brewing, even though I thought I knew a lot about it. And we brewed hundreds of batches, changing one variable at a time, like literally one degree on different in a day on like different Gatorade jugs. And so we came up with a totally new process to do it that respects the ingredients, respects the nuances of fermentation because beer is every bit as nuanced as like a glass of fine wine. And we wanted to respect every element of that. So yeah, it's natural. It's like 10 total changes in the brewing process in different steps, but yep. And that's a big part of why we have our own breweries as well. Um, a lot of non-alcoholic beer is made in all the same mass produced places. Athletic has breweries on both coasts that our team totally runs with the top secret info. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my, sorry. No, that's okay. Let's do this one. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about if you feel that there's a tension between you as someone who has identified this social good that you can pursue of helping people off ramp drinking or drink more moderately. And the fact that as an early mover in the space, you were mentioning all of the big brands that now have an, a, an NA brand. Do you find that there's a tension there between like you as a person with a mission and you in a, as a business person, or are you kind of like, happy to see them enter the space? Yeah, it's an awesome question. And pretty much every investor has uh, asked me that, like basically the, uh, like what if Google does it question where, but like there's ABI and Guinness and everyone. Um, really, I, I see it as such a positive sum game. Um, like I hinted at it earlier that I think it's gonna be like 50% plus of beer in the future which would signal a 50 billion plus category. And we can't possibly make a meaningful amount of that amount of beer. So um, I just think it's such a positive, some early bit of a really big wave that we're happy to have big brand support in marketing and building and making the category cool. And also like, like all of us are so different in our tastes and our occasions and like price points and everything that I want there to be non-alcoholic options of every single kind across every different variable and stuff. So yeah, really happy to have help building the category. Uh, over here. Uh, I still haven't found a beer as good as yours and I've tried all the other That's ones. Great. Uh, so it just will continue to amaze me. Thank uh, thanks for the great product. Um, I noticed that it's always been important to do like two for the trails and now becoming a B Corp and being that side of the business also being part, part of your culture, your brand and things like that. Um, is that something above and beyond the social, you know, the, the helping people offer and non drinking help people have this alternative? How important is that as part of your vision of the, as a company? Hugely important. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, I knew if we didn't make those charitable decisions and like early on in our company life, we could never go back and hard code it in. And so, you know, I, I came from the financial world where you look at so many companies and every single dollar is scraped off and returned to shareholders. And like, I think even be it before you get to charity, like the, the people building companies have so little economics in companies is such a pain point also that we immediately from day one put aside 2% of company stock for our employees, which we call two for the team. Um, and then there's a lot of stock ownership outside of that on our team. And then two for the trails, which is 2% of all sales go to trail and park cleanups um, everywhere we sell beer. And that's hundreds of micro grants a year to trail and park organizations. And yeah, uh, it's an element of athletic that's just really authentic to my lifestyle. I believe really strongly in the need to protect our planet and our climate and that just thinking generations down the line, I want future generations to have access to the outdoors because it is such a healthy, mindful part of the, like not only for mental space, but physical activity spaces. And if, if corporates and the government and everyone don't stand up and protect these outdoor access that they won't be there for many more generations. So mm -hmm. it's definitely a big part of our company. Thanks. Um, one of the things that I think is really genius about your marketing is that you've stayed away from terms like sober sobriety. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really deliberate. 
um, because those terms carry a lot of baggage. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your thinking behind your marketing and messaging um, and uh, you know how you've thought about telling the story of the modern drinker in a new way. Yeah, um, that, that was definitely my goal is uh, to keep the sober elements more to my story and share those on podcasts or in forums like this whenever I could. But generally, um, you know, the, the word sober had really bad branding from the start from prohibition and maybe before, but, um, it's a shut off word for a lot of people where people hear that word and they go, Oh, not for me. Or, and it's like end of conversation, nothing else can change their mind. And so we always tried to approach it with like positivity, making, making moderate choices aspirational and easy and destigmatized. And so that word just really needs a modern overhaul. And uh, so we, that's what we were trying to do. There, uh, just a quick thing. I, I worked for a little while for Impossible Foods, which is one of, you know, with Beyond Meat, one of the two companies making meat from plants, two big companies. And I, I know you've expressed some admiration. Yeah, I love them, yeah. Yeah, it's an amazing company. Um, and... The founder there just decided he's a vegan, lifelong vegan, and he just thought veggie burgers have kind of like reached their top, right? And like vegans are have their veggie burgers, but we need like, so it, we can't just keep trying to refine this. We need to make a burger that can like win on taste. And, um, and this is the same thing here, I think, which is like, this that guy could dream of everyone being vegan and maybe should and maybe there are some people who dream of everyone like a kind of modern uh prohibition but um for the rest of us like you know he used to say making a 15 percent dent in the worldwide burger market would change the planet from you know from space right so it's like restore all this farmland um and you know you have some similar ideas about you make a dent in the beer market and um, it can have all these upsides, right? And mm -hmm. it's not converting people who are already getting Pellegrino, yep. you know, but people who think like maybe one in five drinks might be non-alcoholic, you know? Yeah. Put it, the word dent is part of my evening meditation every day. Really? So, yeah. <laughs> putting a positive dent in the world and having the courage to help play it out. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. It's really good. Hey, uh, Larissa. Um, I was curious if you'd gotten your patent yet on your process, your complicated process. Uh -huh. And as your sales have grown probably astronomically, if you're still committed to giving 2% to your employees and to things like trails, which I personally love. Yep. Um, so we do have a number of different things moving on the patent front. Um, but generally, uh, our, we are, we consider almost more trade secrets too and have it unpublished where, the moment you publish, you actually just go into the business of policing, and we're we're kind of avoiding that also. So it it is a decision at some point, but for now we have not gone public with like publishing the patents and stuff. So, but there are a number of we have like six different total processes now for different beers. So, yeah, and then yeah, all of our programs are intended to scale. Um, our two. 2% for the team is permanently sitting on top of our cap table and everything. So mm -hmm. yep, every new person that comes into our company. So, yeah. Yeah, right here. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, thanks for sharing the stories and for, for making this. I uh, <laughs> first got into this, I think it was the Super Bowl where Brady was playing the Chiefs. And my wife and I were trying, I think, dry January, which bled into dry February. And I first tried the IPA and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. And we were sort of hooked on that since then. This was when distribution wasn't that wide. I was in Jersey at the time. And I would be going to places trying to find athletic brewing because only a few places carried them. Mm -hmm. um, fast forward, you've grown so many different SKUs and varieties to the point where I think that's part of why I've been so loyal and why so many people are so loyal. Because it seems like you're creating things at a pace in which traditional brewers aren't creating the number of different brews that you have from pale ales to golden ales to lights and Oktoberfest. And so I guess my question there besides my comment is like, did you always commit and believe that this was, you were going to be creating this, this, this sheer amount of different types of beer and that, that you'd be able to do it? Because to me, it adds just incredible validity and credibility and happiness to someone that loves beer. To me, it's like, 
it's it's not alcoholic beer for someone that loves beer. And and sometimes it's a spacer and sometimes it's something I drink alone. But like, how did you get down that path of like, besides the science working, did, was, did you always have that epiphany that like, I'm going to make this into a non-alcoholic craft beer brand? Thank you so much. And that's really what it's all about. Um, and uh, I honestly have a lot has, we've learned a lot about what we can do along the way. Like I know the like the mission and the long term was super clear. The details on how we were exactly going to get there and what we were going to be able to offer were definitely hazy. And I definitely don't want to pretend I've ever had a perfect vision of what any steps can look like. Um, and I knew embarrassing. We had I had never brewed a batch of beer when I quit my job either, which was probably a point of delusion and error of itself. But um, I was pretty early on in trialing. I was begging John to. I was like, "Whoa, this is this golden ale starting to taste pretty good." And around like batch thirty, or which was like day forty, I was like, "Can we please try an IPA?" <laughs> and then it was like, "Oh, can we try a stout?" And then like he. The first process failed on that, and we tried a different one. And so, it's our co-founder John is just incredibly talented and such a good chef, also, which lends itself to the brewing. Um, but then we've had so many great brewers join our team from like a who's who of the great breweries mm. across the country, and they've all we have brewing systems from like very small desktop brewing systems almost to three barrel, the seven barrel, the twenty barrel to now our brew houses are like two hundred barrels, but. Anytime anyone wants, anyone in our company can pitch an idea and like grab a brewer and they try to make it on like the three barrel system. And there's absolutely no pressure if it's good or bad. If it's bad, it goes down the drain. If it's good, we launch it on e-commerce and see if anyone else likes it. Yeah. And then, um, but yeah, we launched, I think, 56 beers last year. And so it's, it's a, it's the great thing about having a super talented team an awesome community and our own breweries that we can do it really easily. So it's so cool. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think we have to leave it there. Yes, it's we're, I'm seeing zero. Um, but definitely feel free to ask all questions after and find one of these. They're in short supply already. Um, thanks so much. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.